Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all out this crisp Sunday morning. Good to be in the house of the Lord. And good to have the heat on. Let's begin the service this morning by standing together and turning with me to number 424 as we sing, O come all ye faithful, 424. <laughs> adore him oh come let us adore him oh come let us adore him Christ the Lord sing choirs of angels sing in exaltation oh sing all ye bright hosts of heaven above. Glory to God, glory in the highest. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Yea, Lord, we Happy morning, Jesus, to Thee be all glory given. Word of the Father, now in flesh appearing, O oh, come, let us adore Him, O oh, come, let us adore Him, O oh, come, let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. Amen. Turn back now to number 228. 228. I love to tell the story. <laughs> I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know it is true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story, more wonderful it seems than all the golden fancies of all our golden dreams. I love to tell the story, it did so much for me. And that is just the reason I tell it now to thee. I love to tell the story, will be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story, tis pleasant to repeat what seemed each 
least I might tell it more wonderfully sweet. I love to tell the story, for some have never heard a message of salvation from God's own holy word. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story for those who know it best seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And when in scenes of glory I sing the new, new song, twill be the old, old story that I have loved so long. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Please remain standing. And if you take your Bibles, please, and find the book of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy 3, we'll do our memory verse. 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to do two verses. And um, so we'll do them kind of in unison. We'll do verse 1, and then we'll go to verse 13. So we'll do these two verses four times. And it's good to have first-time visitors visiting with us this morning. Hope you feel a welcome here. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, and then we'll read right after verse 13, and we'll do it four times. Ready? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last day perilous times shall come. Verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And let's look to the Lord, shall we? And Lord, we thank you for this date and time, the 340th day of 2021. It's just a few more days left and 2021 will be history. Thank you for this Lord's Day. Thank you for all that have come out, those listening by way of internet. Chilly, cold morning this morning, minus 30 something. And so some home with sniffles and uh, not feeling well. We do pray for them. And then, of course, Willie in the hospital. We pray your continue care upon him. And uh, Lord, as we think of Nita, Lord, as she is in need of a kidney, we do pray for that need. We pray also for Gretchen's two sisters, the one with um, thyroid cancer and the other one with blood issues. So Lord, health issues will always prevail, even though 
There are those who teach that um, God doesn't want us to get sick. We know that we get sick. These bodies humble us. So again, we thank you that you told your, your servant, Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. So Lord, we pray for grace for each of these. Pray for those Lord, who are away from us. We pray for Amy and Marcel as, Lord, they are now in New Brunswick. Pray that you'll give them a good time of rest. And those who are traveling today, those who are away from us, the girls at school, pray for them as they do their midterms. And then, Lord, we just pray as we come closer to the holiday time and folks will be traveling back and forth, being with family and loved ones. Pray, of course, for Journey of Mercies. Pray, O oh God, that through this time that you will open up doors for us to be effective in our witnessing for you, to tell others about the great, great love that you gave to us and your precious son, but who died and shed his blood and went to the grave and rose victoriously, ascended back to heaven, and Lord, we look forward to his coming again. Pray now that you bless our morning service. May we allow you to have your way in our lives. Speak to our hearts, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you take your Bibles, please find the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter number 7. And then we'll go into chapter 9. My subject this morning is a new government. The topic is a new king coming. The title is, I can't wait. So Isaiah chapter 7, of course, 700 years before the birth of the Lord Jesus, Isaiah looked down his telescope into prophecy, future prophecy, about the birth of a young baby boy that would come through a virgin, supernatural, miraculous monarch. So Isaiah 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bury a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Notice here it's spelt with an I. In the book of Matthew, it's spelt with an E, is our church, Emmanuel Baptist Church. And Emmanuel, of course, means God with us. Now, Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah chapter 9, very familiar scripture at this time of the year to read of the birth of the Christ child. So Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born. That's his virgin birth that we just read about in chapter 7, verse 14. Unto us a son is given. That's his vicarious substitutional death on the cross and payment for sin. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. That's future. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there should be no end. Upon the throne of David, and upon his kingdom, to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. We'll go back to verse number six and we'll take our text. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Father, we certainly are living in what the Bible declares perilous times. We're living in days where it seems like sin is waxing worse and worse. Evil men, seducers all around us. 
But Lord, we thank you that we have a blessed hope, the blessed hope in the Lord Jesus. And we pray the last prayer of the Bible before we begin. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Bless now the preaching of your word. May you instruct us, encourage us. May we look forward to anticipation, the kingdom. And we pray, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Help me as I preach in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a time in the Bible when theocracy ruled and reigned. Find the book of 1 Samuel, please. 1 Samuel chapter 8. When God began a nation, he began a nation under a theocracy. That is, God was ruling and reigning. And he made himself a people. We find that in Genesis chapter 12. When, of course, after the flood, after the Tower of Babel, he brought about the people through his man, Abraham, in Genesis chapter 12, uh, promised to bless them. And God ruled over his people with love, a loving God, a caring God, an intimate God, a personal God. But there came a time when God's people began the fellowship with other nations. And when they did that, they began to acquiesce to these other nations. And because of that, they decided they didn't want God to rule and reign over them. We find that in 1 Samuel chapter 8. And this broke Samuel's heart. Samuel's an old man now. He's a great prophet given by his mother, Hannah, to the Lord as a baby. She prayed for a baby, and God answered her prayer. And then that baby she gave back to the Lord and lent him to the Lord. And of course, God gave her more children. So here's Samuel the prophet, man of God, in verse number one of 1 Samuel chapter 8. And I hope you'll follow me carefully as we lay the foundation of a new government. And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons to judge sons judges over Israel. Now the name of the firstborn was Joel, named the second Abba. They were judges in Beersheba, Abiah. I said Abba, Abiah. Verse 3. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and prevented judgment. Well, that reminds me of government, doesn't it? Took bribes and prevented judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said to him, Behold, thou art old, thy sons walk not in thy ways, nor make, so notice, now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And so Samuel talked to the Lord about it. Now, verse 18. And you shall cry out in that day because of your king, which you have chosen you. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. Now, verses 7 and following, of course, he begins to describe what this king would be like. Verse 19. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us. That we also, now watch it, that we also may be like all the nations. That's where we get the idea everybody's doing it. And because everybody's doing it doesn't make it right. We want to be like all the other nations. And that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. I'd rather have God fight my battles, wouldn't you, than man. And Samuel heard all the words of the people 
and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. Notice capital letters there, that's Jehovah, the self-existing one that reveals himself. And the Lord said to Samuel, hearken unto their voice and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, go ye every man unto his city. Now, if you will, notice, if you will, the book of Hosea. Right after the book of Daniel, we have the minor prophet Hosea. So please find Hosea chapter 13. So it was a king necessary, and what would this king be like? Would he fight the people's battles? Would he provide for them? Would he be a loving, caring monarch or not? Hosea chapter 13 now. Hosea the prophet then cries out. Chapter 13, verse 9. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help. I will be thy king, wherein any other that may save thee in all thy cities. And thy judges of whom thou saidest, give me a king and princes. And I gave thee a king in my anger. God was unhappy. And took him away in my wrath. Now, Psalms chapter 39. So remember, a king, any king, we think of, of Napoleon. We can think of Alexander. We can think of the kings of England and Ireland and Scotland and kings around the world. Famous kings, infamous kings. We can think of Joshua after the death of Moses. Joshua defeated 31 kings and kingdoms. Now here's the problem with man. Now your party may not be in, whether it be NDP, whether it be conservative, whether it be liberal, whether it be the green, blue, yellow, or pink party, whatever party you may want to have, and you look to your party and you put the man or woman in a position of power. And by the way, they sure like power, don't they? Uh, power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. So when you give them power, they want to take more from you. So notice Psalms 39, and again, I'm not being discriminatory, nor am I being unkind or unloving, but I'm just reading the Bible. Psalms 39, and by the way, the center verse of the Bible is Psalms 118, verse 8 and 9. Put not confidence in man, but the Lord. Put not confidence in princes, that would be government, but the Lord. How many times have you voted and the candidate got in, and in just a little while, you discovered he wasn't what he said or she said they would represent, but not God. The Bible says, yea, let God be true and every man a liar. Now notice Psalms 39 then, and verse five. And if you just get your heart around this, it'll help you not to be negative about mankind. And by the way, the Bible says it's mankind. Notice now, verse five, behold, Thou hast made my days as a hand breath. Now think about that. Somebody ever read your hand? <laughs> Let's see, here's your lifeline. <laughs> well, here it is, where they got it from. So, behold, thou hast made my days as a hand breath, and my age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. So vanity, what does that mean? Empty. So the best man, the best position, and the best time, vanity. And notice then the word following the word vanity. Sila. Think about that. Now, again, the Holy Spirit repeats this twice. Look at verse 11. When thou with rebuke dost correct man for inequity, thou maketh his beauty to consume away like a moth. Surely every man 
is vanity, sila. Now, let's look at how the government began. Genesis, please, chapter 9. By the way, how many times have you heard me say from this platform, God instituted three institutions. You ever hear that? Number one was Adam and Eve in the garden. And he placed them in a perfect environment, and they fell. Eve fell by deception. Adam fell by neglect. And God had warned them, the day that you eat of that tree, ye shall surely die. Then, of course, the devil got Eve and deceived her, and she took the fruit. Now, Noah built an ark. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 6 that man did that which was evil continuously. So the world was corrupt, ungodly, and it broke God's heart. So God destroyed the world with a flood. Eight people made it in. Four men and four women. Four men and their wives. Eight people were saved. The rest died in the flood. And God blessed Noah, Genesis 9.1, so here is where he instituted government. And the third institution, anybody know? Anybody? Anybody? The church. So family, government, and the church. And you have to remember, God sets up kingdoms, and God takes down kingdoms. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you should be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, and upon every moving, and all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the seas, sea, unto your hand are they delivered. So, again, think about the authority that God has given to Noah. Every moving thing, verse 3, that liveth shall be meat for you. Now, Man became carnivorous. Up until this point, they were vegetarians. Now you can have meat. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. Don't eat the blood. So you get diseases. And surely your, surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every man. That's capital punishment. Capital punishment is a deterrent. You take man's life, you lose your life. So, surely, your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast, will I require it, and at the hand of man. That's human government. At the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. So there we have man and what God has to say about man. So again, government, human government. God sets up governments. God takes down governments. So man did the best they could. And of course, they fail. Now, let's go back to Isaiah, this time chapter 11. Here's a new government coming. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, what is my subject? A new government. What's my topic? A new king is coming. What's my title? I can't wait. So, we've looked at the negative and realized that there is no perfect government. Doesn't matter who gets in, because they're just man. Uh, man, in his best state, is altogether vanity. And you can put in someone who's a good candidate, and somehow, as he gets in office, they get in office, uh, they begin to realize that there are things that are done in a certain way, and you better not rock the boat. And so that's why, in many cases, uh, those who promise specifics cannot keep those specifics. But there's a king coming. I'm looking forward to that day. I'm looking forward to that day when the king comes. And we'll see that now here in Isaiah chapter 11. So not, let's notice how this comes about. Now, when you look at Genesis chapter three, when Eve fell, God said, I will give a promise savior. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, thy seed and her seed. 
it shall bruise thy heel, and he shall bruise thy head. So Jesus' heel was bruised on the cross when he was crucified. But Satan did all he could to stop the line of Jesus, the line of righteousness and holiness. And he did all he can. And even at the birth of Jesus, remember, Herod tried to kill all the babies. Why? Because Satan did not want Jesus to come and fulfill that promise of Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, thy seed and her seed. That's why there's a difference in the world. Not everybody is righteous. Now, God would have everybody to be righteous, but they're not. But we thank the Lord we have a righteous God and a holy God. And he has order. Man has disorder, but God has order. But again, God doesn't put a key in your back and make you a wind-up toy. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. Now, Genesis or Isaiah 11. And there shall come forth a root. Now that is a person out of the stem of Jesse. Remember, Jesse had a son. His son was King David. So Jesus would come through that lineage. And a branch, that branch there, notice is capital. That's a person that is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And a branch shall grow up out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord, notice the spirit of the Lord, verse 2. And the spirit of the Lord, that's Jehovah, shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him, notice, and shall make him of a quick understanding and the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with inequity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness, faithfulness, the girdle of his reins. Now, have you ever wanted to have a cat or a dog? How about this? By the way, this is talking about the millennium reign. So as we look at what's going on in the world today, the next thing to happen is the tribulation, prophetically. And that is when the world is going to be thrown into chaos because man will be ruining the earth, Satan will be ruling the earth, and God will come and restore. And so what's happening prophetically now is the second coming of Jesus. I can't wait. So he could come today. I heard such a cute story this morning. <laughs> I heard a story about two sisters. And the one sister, she's saved. She's a Christian, little girl. She's trusted Christ as her Savior. Excuse me. The other sister is a little tyrant. So the other sister said to the other sister, well, you need to be saved. And she said, well, I don't want to be saved. Well, you need to be saved so you can go to heaven. Well, I don't want to go to heaven. So the sister said, well, I'm going to pray for you. I kind of went like this. I may be messing it up. And she said, I'm going to pray and talk to the Lord. And she said, dear Jesus, my sister doesn't want to get saved. I pray that you'd help her to know that if she doesn't get saved, when you come, she's going to be left behind. And uh, so what a prayer was that to a young girl about her sister. So Jesus is coming. He could come today. Are you ready? Better be ready. I can't wait. And then when he comes, the tribulation begins upon the earth. And, of course, we have the seven seals. That is man ruining the earth. Then we have seven trumpets. Seven trumpets, of course, is Satan ruling the earth. Then finally we have the seven vials and God restoring the earth. And then we have a 1,000 year millennium reign. And just like Adam and Eve in the garden, that utopia, man's still trying to get that. Setting up kings and kingdoms and nations and trying to have peace. There'll be no peace until the Prince of Peace comes. But that 1,000-year millennium reign, Jesus will rule 
as king of kings. He'll be back on the throne of David that David lost, and he'll be the king. And we, every year, Zechariah says, every year, wherever you're living on the earth, every year, Jerusalem will be the capital of the world. Jesus will be reigning as the monarch, and of course, the Messiah. And every year, we'll go there, of course, for the Feast of Tabernacles. But now, how about the animal kingdom? The animal kingdom is gonna change. How would you like to have a, your own leopard? How'd you like to have a bear in your backyard that doesn't eat up your food? Well, look what's gonna take place here. Isaiah chapter 11, look at how the kingdom is going to be. Amazing, this is going to be. Verse six, and the wolf should draw with the lamb, and the leper shall lie down with the kid, goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child should lead them. That's where you get that from. And the cow and the bear shall eat one another. No, they shall not. Notice, uh, they shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. And the sucking child shall play with the whole of the ass snakes. And the weaned child shall put his hand in the cockatrice den. And they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. Mounts in the Bible speaks of kingdoms. All my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters over the sea. I'm looking forward to that day, aren't you? The day when Jesus comes upon the earth. Now let's look at his birth then. We see here in Isaiah, go back to chapter 9, verse number 6, and verse number 7, or verse 14 of chapter 7, we see the virgin-born child. I think about this. Just a few days we'll be celebrating Christmas and everybody will be thinking about the Christ child, and, and rightly so, and it should be. And by the way, in front of our house and some of the other folks in our church, they have a nativity scene in front of the house. And uh, so people can come by and see something other than Santa Claus and the reindeers and so forth. And uh, they can see what Christmas ought to be about. It's the birth of a holy child. Look again in Isaiah 9 and verse 6. Here's a prophecy. Hundreds of years before the birth of the Christ child. For unto us a child is born. That's his virgin birth. Unto us a son is given. Again, his vicarious substitutional crucifixion for our sins. And the government should be upon his shoulders. Now let's notice this. Go with me to Matthew first, please. And here's where the word Emmanuel goes from I to the letter E. It means the same thing. It means God with us. The reason that I named our church the Emmanuel Baptist Church is because here in Isaiah, I saw that the word Emmanuel means God with us. Now, Matthew chapter 1. Again, here we have Joseph married to a young virgin by the name of Mary. He can't wait for that wedding day. He's engaged to her. But something has occurred. Mary has gone off to visit her cousin Elizabeth. And now she comes back. And Joseph is shocked. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, that means they were engaged, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example since she was not a virgin now and she's got this baby, Joseph has figured, why would she do this to me? She's gone off with another man and she's having this. I know it's not my baby. My heart is broken. This is horrible. The law says I can have her stoned, but I love her. I don't want to stone her. I love her. What am I going to do? And Joseph is certainly on a horn of a dilemma. Notice, was minded to put her away privily. I just, just want to get this away. I just want to get this away. 
But while he thought on these things, verse 20, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David. That is, Joseph, of course, is out of the lineage of David. Fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife. Here it is. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name, all caps, Jesus. And what does the name Jesus mean? For he shall save his people from their sins. And all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet Isaiah. Here is a quote, direct quote from Isaiah 7, 14. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And here's the explanation of the name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. I like that. God with us. How comforting to know that God wants to be with us. And Joseph, being raised from the sleep, wow, can you imagine the excitement? I can marry her. We can be married. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not. So, no intimacy. She had, until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and called his name Jesus. Now let's go further. Luke chapter 1. The birth of the king. God's king. God's rightful king. Luke chapter 1. Here we have a young teenager. By the name of Mary. She also is going to have a visit. From Gabriel. Gabriel always brings good news. Michael is the warring angel for Israel. But Gabriel is the news messenger spreader. So notice, let's just read the story. Luke 1, 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, there you have it, espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. An angel came unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind, what in the world is this guy talking about? That's my version. What manner of salutation this should be? And the angel said unto her, same thing he said to Joseph, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Now watch this. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. That's the 1,000 year millennium kingdom. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob. And I like this. Kingdoms rise and they fall, but not his. And of his kingdom, there should be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, good question. How shall this be, seeing I know not Amen. Now watch this. This is so precious. And the angel answered and said unto her, Now just think about this, folks. Just think about this. If you've never had a baby and you're not married, the Holy Ghost should come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing, do you see that? Which should be born of thee should be called the Son of God. Now go to the book of Acts chapter 15. God's king is coming and he's going to reign upon the throne of David. 
And he's going to set up a kingdom. That should be like no other kingdom. Acts chapter 15. And verse 13. Now here's the discussion about circumcision, about Jesus alone, or do you have to do something else to be saved? No, it's Jesus alone. Now if they, they had laid their... Notice, and after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Watch this now. Simeon, or Peter, hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. We're now living in what the Bible calls the age of grace, the age of the church. The Jews rejected Jesus. Remember when Jesus came, they said, let not this man reign over us. He came to be a king. Pilate said, are you a king? When they were crucifying him. Are you a king? He said, to this end was I born. And yet when he came to the Jew, the Jew rejected him. And they said, we'll not have this man to reign over us. And for 2,000 years, the Jewish nation became a nomad. No name, no nation, a scattered people. But in May the 14th, 1948, 73 years ago, the Jews came back to their land. And the Bible is very specific. And the Bible says you want to point to the future when you see the Jews back in her land. And you see that fig tree blossoming. This generation shall not pass till all be fulfilled. I believe we're living in the generation when Jesus is coming again. And since 1948, the Jews have flourished. The Jews have not lost the war since 1948. Three battles, three victories, three yet more to come. And so we think of God's timing. We are in the frontage now, the Gentiles, the church. Jesus loved the church and died for the church. But Jesus also loves the Jew. And of course, the Jew rejected their king, but he's coming again. And here's what James is saying. At the first, did visit the Gentiles to take out of them the people for his name. And notice, and to this agreed the word of the prophet, as is written. After this, after what? After the church age. After this. I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. The Jews rejected their Messiah. You find that in Romans chapter 11. God set them aside and ushered in the Gentile. I will build again, will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof and will set it up. That the residue of men might seek after the Lord. And all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called unto the Lord, who doth all these things, known unto God. Now watch this. Nothing ever occurs to God. God has everything in control. Doesn't seem like it, but he does. Known of God are all his works from the beginning of the world. So God has his plan. His plan is being worked out. Now, 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. So God has a government that he's going to establish for 1,000 years, the 1,000 year millennium reign. Jesus will be sitting on the throne of David. God promised David a perpetual kingdom, but that's been lost because the Jews rejected their Messiah. But Jesus is coming again. When he comes, we who are saved get to go to be with him and glory. Down on the earth begins a horrible time called the tribulation. Three and a half years, trouble, unrest, unbelievable disharmony, unbelievable when the Antichrist is sitting and reigning and ruling. And then three and a half years of the great tribulation. Two billion people will die during the, that tribulation time. Nations will fall. 
Kingdoms will fall. Horrible trouble upon the earth called Jacob's trouble. The Jew will be judged. Millions will die to get them ready to go into the millennium reign. When Jesus is sitting upon the throne of David, this time they'll embrace him. Now notice what Paul had to say about this. 1 Corinthians 15. But now is Christ risen from the dead. Verse 20. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead. Thank the Lord for the resurrection. He died, was buried, and rose again. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruit of them that slept. In other words, he's the first one who rose again from the dead and didn't die again. For since by man came death, that was Adam in the garden when he took the fruit, the forbidden fruit and fowl. Eve deceived, but Adam said, give me the fruit. Eve fell into sin, and now she was naked and ashamed and blushing. And Adam saw his bride. And there was a separation because of sin. Adam knew that he could have taken Eve to the end of the garden and said, get out. But he loved her and said, give me the fruit. And Jesus, to you and I, and to all mankind, said, I'll take the cross. And what Adam lost in the garden, Jesus recovered when he died on the cross and shed his blood and payment for us. And so the cradle, the babe in the cradle, can't save anybody. But the Christ on the cross, a son is given. A child is born, virgin birth. A son is given. The vicarious substitutional death of cross on the cross. Christ on the cross for our sins. Dying. Tasting death. Separation from God. Humiliation. Shame. Rejected. Denied. Forsaken. Forgotten. And even cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because of me and my sin. Because of you and your sin. But God made a way for us to get back to him. Through the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And one day he's coming again. To bring life and liberty. And all the politicians and all the governments. And all the ungodliness. And evil man waxing worse and worse. That will be over with. And we'll have a millennium kingdom. And Christ will reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But now, wait a minute. You and I will have a part of that kingdom based on what we've done for Christ after our salvation. Nobody works to get saved. Salvation is free, all of grace. Jesus did it all. All to him I owe. Sin hath left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And so Paul is saying here that because of Adam... For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For in Adam all die. Everybody's born a descendant of Adam and Eve. Everybody is born a descendant of Adam and Eve. And that's why Jesus came, born of a virgin. Mary's blood, Joseph's blood did not taint his body because the Bible says the Holy Ghost shall overshadow that means Mary's blood was not mixed with Jesus' blood. His blood is supernatural blood. Peter calls it precious blood. Know you not that you are not redeemed, but corruptible things of silver and gold received by the traditions of your father, but the precious blood of Christ is of a lamb without blemish, without spot, who was foreordained before the foundation of the world and now manifested for us. For in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. This morning, you're either in Adam and lost and on your way to hell, or in Christ saved and on your way to heaven. Now the point is, what do we do after salvation? We should serve the Lord. We should be faithful with the Lord. We should be obedient to the Lord. We should walk faith with the Lord. But we're living in perilous times, aren't we? Paul said, perilous times shall come. 
Men should be lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And Paul, that's why I took that text from 2 Timothy chapter 3. Perilous times are upon us. Man's hearts failing them. Waxing worse and worse. Evil men deceiving and being deceived. And Paul admonishes young Timothy to be mindful. And I want to read this to you as we finish here. Let me read this to you. So important. Ah, Christmas is coming. Let's be joyful. Come all ye faithful. Hark the herald angels sing. Wonderful time. But we need to be mindful also that time is short. Time is short. Only a short time left to witness for, the, for Christ and talk about the cross. Yes, thank the Lord for the, the, the cross. It was a tree. And yes, Christmas trees, we have them and we have gifts and so forth. But how about the tree that Jesus was crucified on? We must keep that in our heart. For men should be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affections, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, no control, fierce, despisers of those that are good. You do right. You live right. You walk with the Lord and you be faithful. Noah in his day, it was Noah and Mrs. Noah, Ham, Sham, and Japheth and their wives, and that's all that got in the ark. The rest perished with the flood. So righteousness is right. Living right is right. Making right choices are right. Living for the Lord, being faithful to him in this perverse and wicked generation that we're living in, beloved. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. There it is, isn't it? I can't come to church Sunday. I have too many things to do. I, I just, you know, I just work all week and I just have too many things to do. Well, what did Jesus do for us? He made no excuse. He went all the way to the cross, shed his blood for us, tasted death for us, rose again for us. And that would be the greatest gift you could ever give someone this year to tell them how to get to heaven. And then to be mindful, if you're saved this morning, we ought to have grateful hearts, thankful hearts for our precious king. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. For this sort are they which creep in the houses and lead captive silly women led with sin, led away from diverse lust. I'm reading 2 Timothy chapter 3. Ever learning and never able to come to knowledge of the truth. Now as Jamrus and Jamrus withstood Moses, so they resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. What's a reprobate? A reprobate is someone who cares nothing, nothing about God's holiness and God's righteousness. That's called the apostasy, beloved. The apostasy is the falling away of God's people. We're in it. I heard a infamous or famous preacher, so-called, sells a lot of books on the television and the radio. And he said that the apostasy begins during the tribulation. He's dead wrong. Apostasy has been going on for many years. The apostasy is God's people who know the truth, resist the truth, and fall away. One of the ways that Fort McMurray has suffered was back in the fire. And someone said to me in recent days, you know, our church has changed since the fire. And it has. People seem to be more concerned about entertainment than coming to church. And there was a slowly drifting and falling away. Entertainment. Enjoying themselves. Taking more holidays. Rather than you thought that would bring them closer to the Lord. And then came the pandemic. And the pandemic. Fearful for our lives. And of course we were, weren't we? We thought, well, if we touched someone, we would die. Someone breathed on us, we would die. And there was a lot of fear. 
and there was much fear. And now that's been almost two years. And now if you look around, again, I'm not being critical, but I'm just being realist. Being realist, not being a fatalist, not being pessimistic. But so many people have just stepped away from the things of the Lord. And that's a sign, beloved, that Jesus is not too far from coming. How do you know that, preacher? Because the Bible says, Jesus says, when he comes, will he find any faith? And this is the coldest day of the year. And you're here this morning. I'm not critical of those who didn't show up, but you're here this morning. And God bless you. I didn't want to come this morning either. I had a little bit of a cough. And, and I don't have it, but I have a little bit of a cough and uh, have a little bit of a headache. And uh, so I said to Mr. Glenn, I'm not going this morning. I'm going to call in sick. And I cannot believe, I knew this was happening. I cannot believe how many people text me, have a sniffles, have a toe ache, have a backache. And, uh, and, that's, and I, so I said, if you don't come to church, you better not go to school tomorrow. And you better not go to work tomorrow. But whatever. So the point is we're living in horrible times. We're living in times where people fall away. And why do they fall away? So many different reasons. And I believe many are just like the Israelites. Now, don't lose me. The Israelites said, we want a king. We want to be like the world. Love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. is not of the Father, but is the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Eve saw the fruit. Once she saw the fruit, she lusted after the fruit. She said, man, that must taste good. And Satan said, God does know that when you eat of that tree, you should be as God, knowing good and evil. He lied to her. And she fell for the lie. And she took the fruit and gave to Adam and look at the world today. All because of a wrong choice. Look at the Middle East. All because of a wrong choice. Sarah said to Abraham, I don't think God's holding on. I don't think you're going to get, I don't think we're going to get that boy. You better marry my handmaiden Hagar. And out of that came the Arab nation. And look at the Middle East. No peace in the Middle East, beloved. So as we think about this falling away, it, it totally breaks my heart. But notice what he said. Reprobates concerning the faith. And they should proceed no further. For their folly should be manifest in all men. As there also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine. Manner of life. Purpose. Faith. Long-suffering. Charity. Patience. Persecutions. Afflictions. Which came on me in Antioch. In Iconium. And Lystra. What persecution I endured. But out of them all the Lord. Delivered me. Now. Keep your finger in 1 Corinthians. I just go to Revelation 1 for a moment. i never seen this. I preached Revelation. I guess I've gone through the book of Revelation four times and almost 43 years of preaching. But until I prepared this message yesterday, I never saw this. I mean, I have saw it, but I never realized it because it's applicable in my message. A new king. A new government, a new people, a righteous people. Revelation 1, verse 5, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the, and the what? And the prince of the kings of the earth. Hallelujah. The prince of the king of the earth. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Go back to Corinthians 15 and I am done. We ended up in verse 23. But every man his own order, Christ the first fruit. After that, they that are Christ at his coming. Then, watch it now. Verse 24, 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Then cometh the end, when Christ shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule, all authority, and power, and, shall, and he must reign till he hath put everything 
He had put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that should be destroyed is death. Shall we stand together? A new kingdom coming. A new king and a new people. And the government should be upon his shoulder. He should be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of his government, there should be no end. And as I began this morning, even so, come Lord Jesus. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Lord, Sunday is a new day of the beginning of a week. What's in a week? What's in a day? And Lord, to know that this is the day that you, after your resurrection, has set aside for people to come to church. Used to be days gone by, there was the bell. The church bells would ring calling people to church. And oh God, December the 5th, 340th day of 2021. We are living in horrible times. Evil men, evil men, evil governments, tyranny, reprisals, control and power we're living in that trying to keep our heads above water like the kettle that sings when the water is up to its nose trying to live in a world that's gone mad God, help us to make a difference. Help us to be true and effective witnesses for Christ's sake. All our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I wonder if one of you ushers can step out and, and see if the children can be a little quiet in the nursery there. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. How important time. James says, what is your life but a vapor that appeareth for a little time and vanishes away? What is your life? How many years do you have left? Where are you in your hand's breath before a holy God? How much time do you have left? With heads bowed and eyes closed. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Will we give the invitation. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Preacher, God spoke to my heart this morning. What he spoke to your heart about is between you and him. Did he speak to your heart about your faithfulness, your prayer time, your Bible reading, your devotion, your witnessing, your wealth, sharing with him, your work for him. Did he speak to you about any of that this morning? While our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Preacher, pray for me. God spoke to my heart this morning about some matter of my walk as a Christian. God spoke to my heart. God spoke to my heart. God spoke to my heart. Thank you. You may take them down. I wonder if someone in the sound of my voice this morning, whether by the way of airway or here in the auditorium. God spoke to my heart about that kingdom business. I don't want to miss that kingdom. I'm not sure if I died today or when I die, I'm going to heaven. I'm not sure. I don't know. But I'd like to know. Preacher, would you remember me in closing prayer? I'm not saved. I don't know if I died today, I'd go to heaven. But I know I'm going to live somewhere. By the way, all of us, you have an eternal spirit. You're going to live somewhere forever, either heaven or hell. There's nothing in between. Forever. 
you're never going to die. Different kind of body, of course, for heaven, obviously, and a different kind of body in hell, but you're going to live forever. The choice is yours what way you're going. Preacher, remember me in closing prayer this morning? I'm not sure. If I die today, I'd go to heaven. Would you remember me in closing prayer? Here's my hand. Here's my hand. Please pray for me. Remember me in closing prayer. Remember me. And Father, you see into our hearts, which is a wonderful thought. You actually see in our hearts and know what's going on in our lives. The sadness, the brokenness, the fearfulness. So many people fearful, and the Bible says, man's hearts, man's heart, fearful, living in fear. Lord, that's not what you have for your children. Thou has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Oh God, help us to be about your business. A new kingdom, a new king, and a new people. I pray now that you bless this invitation, this day, this Lord's day. I pray you've spoken to our hearts. Help us to respond to that which you've spoken to us about. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Two hundred.